This is Nursing 622, Module 11, Gynecological Cancer, Menopause, Breast Health, and Osteoporosis. Your objectives to identify prevention and screening for these gynecological breast and uterine cancers um, across the lifespan, the didactic modalities, and uh, treatment plans as well. So when we look at the menstrual cycle, it's every 24 to 38 days. We have perimenstrual and pelvic symptoms and syndromes. We know that the follicles secrete estrogen, the endometrium then proliferates, ovulation occurs. And then we have all of these different things that are happening with the hormones. The estrogen and progesterone stabilize the endometrium and they prepare it for implantation. If fertilization doesn't occur, we know that corpus luteum degenerates, the hormone levels drop, that uterine lining is sloughed off and you can have that withdrawal bleeding. Abnormal uterine bleeding, or also called dysfunctional uterine bleeding, is very common in uh, women. Um, it can be heavy menstrual bleeding, it can be intermenstrual bleeding. Um, there is uh, etiology and components of the classification, which we'll go over. Risk factors are younger age, obesity. Again, you have higher glucose rates when you're obese, and then um, Caucasian. Heavier, longer bleeding, soaking pads in less than two hours, bleeding in between periods, after intercourse, spotting at any time, bleeding after menopause. Remember, bleeding after menopause. Menopause is that one year of no period is cause for concern for further evaluation. And medical history, physical examination are important here. We look at the differential diagnosis. Is this a secondary cause? Is something else going on? So we're gonna monitor their labs, see if there's any abnormalities. Look at diagnostic testing with ultrasounds. There's multiple other things that OBGYN can do uh, listed there. And we're gonna look at that manic, uh, medical management of acute or chronic. Someone will tell you, listen, I spot between my periods. I've always had this. I've had the full workup. They never find anything. This is normal for me. Confirming that, getting the records is very important, but also important why we need to have a good history. When we look at surgical management, um, histoscopies can be done. There can be uterine artery embolization, hysterectomy, endometrial ablation. Again, those are all things a specialist is going to um, be doing. You're going to refer them out. They can try self-management with alternative therapies. The etiology could be from a primary cause for amenorrhea, right? It does not necessarily mean that nothing else is going on. Some of the more common are you're very fit, very active, you know, high acuity with sports and things like that can delay the onset of menarche, can also cause amenorrhea. Hypothalamic, pituitary, ovarian, polycystic ovarian. Again, you need to make sure that you are ruling out any other causes. So we look at these risk factors. We've talked about smoking drug use, those things can also cause amenorrhea, a good history and physical, looking for differential diagnosis, and then pursuing it further and referring to the specialist as needed. Step one, looking at those hormone levels, then step two is more in depth, which will likely be done by the specialist, and then step three as well. Understanding that there's different steps and where you need to start with, you can start by ordering the hormone levels to get those labs going before they can get into CGYN if it's gonna be a couple of weeks. After that, they really should be seeing the specialist for further workup and testing from a GYN standpoint. Menstrual headaches, these can happen. It can be unilateral, pulsating. They can have the photophobia. It can last anywhere from a few hours to a few days. They can have auras. Again, it's important to rule out any other causes. When we look at this, we wanna make sure there's no acute focal neural deficit. What do I mean? Do I mean, are they having double vision, floaters? Are they having gait imbalances, unilateral weakness, decreased grip strength? Those things we need to assess and take care of first before just saying, oh, it's because of their menses. Differential diagnosis, like I was talking about, diagnostic studies, labs, could their electrolytes be off? Are they anemic? Treatment and management, again, self-management, um, 
They can do a lot of different alternative therapies. You can talk about NSAID use. And again, you want to rule out anything else. That way you're not missing something that could be more severe. When we look at dysmenorrhea, this is painful or difficult when you have your menses. So symptoms are pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, that fatigue. They can have some insomnia associated. Usually it's secondary to the symptoms above. Taking a good health history, finding out when they're having these painful menses. Looking at other differential diagnosis. Is it only with their menses? Is it true dysmenorrhea? Is there a family history? A lot of times you'll hear them say, oh, mom said she had really bad periods, really heavy, really painful. And that's where genetic comes into play. Again, taking a good family health history, history and physical is going to be important here. Midlife women's health definitions, perceptions, transitions. What is midlife? Midlife is 35 to 65 years old, right? This is where we're going to start seeing the perimenopausal phase. You can have that abnormal uterine bleeding, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. This can happen as they're starting to transition into menopause. This is a woman's own perception of age. This is a stigmatism that we have saying, oh man, I'm midlife. This is where the term midlife crisis comes in, you know, and it's a huge transition. And you have to look at the psychosocial aspect um, of work, of childbearing years, and all of these different things that come into play with entering into midlife. When you're looking at the menopausal transition, remember, Menopause is sensation of menses one year after that final menstrual period. And oftentimes women know that they're perimenopausal and that they're moving into that stage of menopause. So you can have that transition of some depression as you're moving into that because it's an indicator by your body saying, hey, you're aging, you're moving into that menopausal stage. Some women welcome it and some don't. Everyone has their own self-perception of it. This is the end of reproductive capacity. You have hormone changes. There's lots of symptoms, emotions, and it is part of the aging process. What are the symptoms? Hot flashes, sleep disruption. This is always usually secondary to all of those symptoms associated with menopause. They can become depressed. They can also have decline in memory, concentration, learning as part of the aging process. Again, this could be a normal aging process, but we need to rule out any other causes if they're having significant memory loss or they're very forgetful more than what is anticipated at this age. You can start having aches and pains as aging, decreased sexual desire, you can have that vaginal atrophy that makes it uncomfortable so they don't want to have sex, urinary incontinence. So these are all things that play into each other and talking with your patient and seeing how they feel. It might not be that they don't have a desire, but it's so uncomfortable and painful that they just don't want to have those sexual interactions. So menopausal transitioning, the metabolic changes, bones. We know there's decreased mask because there's a decrease in estrogen. There can be some progression into osteoporosis. This is why we have those bone density screenings. This is why we talk about calcium with vitamin D. You need that vitamin D for that calcium to be able to get in and get absorbed. You can only absorb a certain amount of calcium at a time, which is why we tell women, don't take three calcium pills at one time. You're going to excrete what your body can't absorb. You take it at different times during the day. Muscle mass is decreased, loss of strength, increase in fat. You can have endocrine changes, impaired fasting glucose. You can have thyroid issues. Understanding that you can have your lipids start to go up, insulin resistant. These are all these endocrine changes that can happen due to the changes physically in the body with the decreased muscle mass, increased fat. And then you have an increased stress response. You can have an inflammatory response, ruling out other causes if it's acute, but also understanding that these are things that they're going to have to transition into with their menopause. Healthy promotion for midlife, uh, exercise, no smoking, tobacco use, BMI, want to watch because again, we have that increase in fat, decreased muscle mass, harder to lose weight. 
We also want to look for depression with that whole psychosocial component using those omega-3 omega fatty acids for elevated lipids, looking at the diets, limiting alcohol consumption. Coronary heart disease starts to increase due to increased obesity, those endocrine changes, increased blood pressure, the increased risks of diabetes. These are all things that come into play that can lead them to be at a higher risk for coronary artery disease, as well as cancer, as well as osteoporosis. We know that calcium and vitamin D, like I just said. Screening them for depression and anxiety. How are you handling it? How are you doing with it? Age-related changes, increased vascular thickening, stiffness, therefore increased risk for hypertension, cardiovascular disease. Remember, women are very atypical when they present for cardiovascular disease. Oftentimes, they don't present with that crushing chest pain. They might have shoulder pain or back pain, or if they have impaired fasting glucose, have no symptoms at all. They have a cognitive decline. Their short and long-term memory can decrease, but remember, we need to rule out other causes. Looking at those sensory changes, glaucoma, cataracts, macular degeneration, those things, which is why vision screenings every year, dental screenings every year are so important. When we look at the hypertension, coronary artery disease, stroke, angina, MI, educating your patient on what to watch for is important. Greater than 75% of cancers are diagnosed at the age of greater than 35, and we know that's as you're progressing through that midlife into older women. Remember that a lot of these cancers, when they are found, are more end stage. You look at the ovarian and pancreatic and sometimes breast. These are found when they're stage three and four. Type two diabetes, your risk goes up. Arthritis, osteoporosis, and what happens, we talk about hip fractures if they fall because their bones are more brittle, lack of estrogen, decreased calcium and vitamin D intake, can lead to those hip fractures and that can be very detrimental. It's oftentimes something that takes an older, an adult from being mobile and more independent to now relying on someone else when they're trying to recover from a hip fracture. Cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's, dementias, we have our um, tests that we do in the office, the mini mental exams to take a look at impairments look for depression, urinary incontinence, and then you run into possible elder mistreatment. If they are now looked at as a burden on their family members, do we worry about elder abuse? These are things we need to screen for. Medication management, we have an increase in meds because we know they're at higher risk for all of these other chronic diseases now. So we need to check their medications every time they come in for a visit, make sure that they know what they're taking or someone is helping them set up their medications, making sure they're going to their bone density screenings, taking their calcium and vitamin D to reduce the risk of osteoporosis. Vaccinations, are they getting their flu shot? Now we add on COVID uh, boosters, pneumococcal, you know, shingles vaccines. These are all very important. Menopause. Average age is 51, could be early or late. Again, family health history is important because some women go into menopause early, but there's a family history. There's a genetic component. Perimenopause is that two to 10 years preceding the final menstrual period. You can have dysfunctional uterine bleeding. 12 months of amenorrhea immediately before menopause is perimenopause. Postmenopause is five years following menopause. And we know menopause now is that one year right of no vaginal bleeding no uterine bleeding you have a decrease in those hormones and then postmenopause is those five years after we know that as those levels are decreasing you have the vaginal atrophy you can have that dryness decrease in sexuality hot flashes looking at the abrupt changes that can occur and other alternative therapies can be indicated because people are very scared about taking hormone replacement therapy because of the risk of blood clots and different things. Factors that can affect it, smoking, uh, earlier onset of menopause, um, you know, obesity, fibroids, genetics. Genetics comes into play with a lot of these things. Ethnicity, socioeconomic, lifestyle, health factors. These are all things that when we're talking about 
menopause and aging, we need that good family health history, even if it's to refer back to, to say, okay, yes, yeah, I remember she told me her mom went into menopause early or she used to smoke but quit five years ago. Reasons why you need to document this in your charts. Symptoms of menopause, some women have none, some have occasional, some are more severe than others. Again, monitoring those symptoms and is it affecting their quality of life? Are they able to function, perform their activities of daily living? If it's affecting their quality of life, then an intervention needs to be made. If it's not affecting their quality of life and they don't want an intervention, why can we not talk about lifestyle modification and other alternative methods to try to help reduce the symptoms? But if it's not changing their life and they don't want to do anything about it, then that is absolutely their right. Treatment and management, avoiding caffeine, sugar, alcohol, spicy foods. Remember, chocolate has caffeine in it. Um, increase water intake, um, exercise, environment changes, um, knowing that you might not be able to control your body temperature well. Why? Because the endocrine system is what manages that. So when you have changes in the endocrine system and you're inappropriately able to manage it, we expect this where we have hot flashes and then they're fine. And that's why wearing of layers. So then when those surges happen, it's not as uncomfortable for them, especially in public. Water-based vaginal lubricants for the vaginal atrophy and dryness, sleep aids, smoking sensation, stress management, and things that are going to help their memory be enhanced. You know, you talk about those brain games and different things. You'll see a lot of them doing crossword puzzles, and that is good for the brain. It's good stimulation. It helps with memory function enhancement because we know as you age, there is a decrease. Complementary uh, alternative medicine, red clover, soy, there's some herbal products, but again, be careful with that polypharmacy and certain herbal products. St. John's wort is huge with interactions with medications, especially cardiovascular meds, progesterone cream, acupuncture, and then you have the pharmacotherapeutics. You have your hormone therapy. Most people are very scared of that. Why? Because of blood clots. That's huge when you know you talk about that. But we know there's the bone loss and they don't wanna have a hip fracture, so what other alternatives could we talk about? And then non-hormone treatment management focuses on that psychosocial. We look at the SSRIs and the SNRIs, why? Because we know that there is some level of depression based on the symptoms and the aging process. And this helps with decreasing stress, helps with the management of menopause. Anticonvulsants, hypertensive, these breast cancer agents. Again, if you're going this far with hormone replacement therapy and other alternative prescribed medication, there should be dialogue with the specialist for their recommendations. If you want to continue and help with management in between their annual visits, that's one thing. Should you alone be implementing this and monitoring as a primary care physician, it is not recommended. Special considerations, um, pregnancy and perimenopause can happen. They think, no, I'm going through my change. That's why I haven't had my period in three months. And lo and behold, their pregnancy test is positive. So remember, contraception is still recommended until they hit that menopause stage. Um, temporary menopause or premature can be early loss of fertility. Higher risk for osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, that's often linked with the smoking aspect of it, the obesity, the impaired fasting glucose. And there is research on hormone therapy, non-hormone therapy, those alternative medicines. Look at the quality of life. How can I make your quality of life better to help you manage and deal with the symptoms that you're having? Osteoporosis is musculoskeletal, it's your bone mineral density, 2.5 or more standard deviation below the mean of a young adult, right? So we have that standard norm that we look at when we do those bone density tests. Primary occurs with aging, accelerates at menopause, and then secondary, it can be due to another medical condition or treatment. Peak bone mass occurs 30 to 35, bone formation then starts to slow, a decrease in estrogen and progesterone during that perimenopause phase accelerates that bone loss 
and then age-related bone loss begins at the age of 50. Potentially modifiable, you know, some chronic diseases, having better management of them, cigarette smoking, that low estrogen level, um, not having children, you know, poor nutrition, sedentary lifestyle, non-modifiable. Remember, these are your genetic factors and other factors that come into play you have no control of. Advanced age, can you control how you're aging? No. Your age is going to go whether you like it or not. Delayed puberty, endocrine disorders, family history, being a female, history of fractures, your race, your genes. These are non-modifiable. Know the difference between modifiable and non-modifiable. So taking a good health history, medications, health habits, assessing for falls, hearing and vision impairments, what is the home like? We talk about rugs, is things secure? Are there railings in the house? How is their gait when they walk into the exam room? How is their blood pressure? Do they have vertigo? Do they get orthostatic when they sit up or stand? Looking at that Romberg test, seeing if they're swaying, if there's a problem with their cerebellar function. Diagnostic studies, the DEXA scan is the gold standard. Other methods um, oftentimes require a specialist to order. And if there's further issues, stemming from the DEXA scan, it is a good idea to get the specialist input and have their recommendations um, for the osteoporosis. Treatment and management, again, calcium needs to be taken with that vitamin D so it can be absorbed. We don't want them taking a ton in the morning because you're just going to excrete it. It's not going to stay absorbed. Citric acid, protein, fiber intake, you know, taking fiber pills if their diet isn't adequate enough. That phosphorus, citric acid, they have those women's health multivitamins. A lot of these are in there. Tell them if you're not, if your diet's not good enough and you're having a hard time with it, take a supplement. Get those on board to help with self-management. Avoiding the caffeine, exercise, yoga, tai chi. These all help with bone strength and mobility, which we know decreases as we age. Again, smoking cessation and fall prevention. Complementary alternative methods. Again, decreasing stress is going to help with a lot of the symptoms and some of the other risk factors. Pharmacotherapeutics. Recommendation for postmenopausal women who have a T-score of negative 2.5 or less, right? That's that standard deviation or if they've had a hip fracture or incidental vertebral fracture, especially if it's non-traumatic, or if they have a combined T-score of negative one to 2.5 at the femoral neck, total hip or spine. And then you use that calculated risk assessment algorithm, and then they meet the criteria for NOF for initiating medication. We have the anti-reabsorptive uh, agents that we can use with the biophosphonates like Fosamax, those monoclonal antibodies, the calcitonin, you see them using calcitonin sprays, hormone therapy, these are all recommendations for osteoporosis, but they all come with their own risks as well as benefits. And then we look at different foods um, and anabolic agents. And your references with your readings and resources.